Hey everybody, welcome to Liberty Life. Today we're going to be discussing Judah. Judah, the tribe of Judah, the lion from the tribe of Judah. That's right. This is the tribe from which our Lord our God comes from in the flesh. Emmanuel from the tribe of Judah. And get this, he comes from the tribe of Judah from both mother and father, paternal and maternal, right? Salvation is of the Jews. Jesus Christ came in the body of a Jew. So what is Jew? Jew, Judah. It means a man of praise. You see, the name originally comes from Leah's fourth child, Judah. She said, now my husband will praise me because I have borne him four children. So she named her child Judah, which means he will be praised or he will be of praise. So a Jew today, it says in Romans, a Jew, a true Jew is one who's right in his heart with God. It means someone who praises God, someone who exalts and extols the Lord for his magnificent worth. And this is where the word Jew comes from. Now, Judah, child number four of 12, 12 brothers, one daughter, Dina, and all the sons, the federal heads of Israel, Judah is also where David comes from. David, that's right, the famous David, the archetype of Messiah, King David, who was Solomon's father. Now, the tribe of Judah's stone color, some say it's carnelian red, but we like to think it's more of like a tehillit blue. Uh, remember that the high priest was wear, uh, was robed in royal blue. Look at this miel here. Uh, this color blue represents righteousness, it represents the law. And remember the law and its judicial uh, wisdom is kind of where the kingship gets its strength. Now, for an example, this blue comes from the Merx trunculus, which after it's oxygenated and, and, and hits the dibromo indigo from the sunlight, the vitamin D breaks down the dibromo indigo and just makes it indigo. Well, before that it's purple. And purple we know is royal purple. Why do you know it is royal purple? Because kings and rulers wore this garment of this color dye from the Merx trunculus in the biblical era. It was so expensive, no one could afford it. And the same blue and the same purple comes from the same Merx trunculus shell. Now, if kings are wearing purple, they're also gonna be wearing blue. So it's possible that David was robed in this blue. And this is why now, the kingship that never departed from Judah is known for the flag of Israel by these colors, blue and white. And the star of David, they call it the Magen David, is a six-pointed star, which we have archeological evidence. And this Magen David was supposed to be the shield of David. Now, if you look at D Dalit, Vav Dalit, and you look at the two D's together that could look like the Star of David. That's where some people say it comes from. Other people say it was just a geological design, uh, which had, you know, which had a beautiful points. Look at this. This is a, a a gate from one of the synagogues. How beautiful. But look at the symmetry here. And that's something we don't see too much of anymore, but back in the day and in the future, this symmetry of beauty is going to be all over. So the Star of David definitely makes sense on multiple levels for beauty. And again, it's called the Magen David, which means the shield of David, because some people believe that that was on David's shield, this symbol. Okay, let's move into the tribe of Judah. The tribe of Judah, by the way, Judah was the only brother that tried to get people besides Reuben not to kill Joseph. Remember, they threw him into his cistern and then he was sold to Ishmaelite traders and he makes his way to Egypt. Well, Judah is one of the ones that tried to stop this. So already his hero inside is coming out to do what is right. And this is, again, something that he will be praised for later on. There's one more thing about Judah, which is prophetic and profound, why he gets the blessing. Look what happens in Genesis 46. All of the sons in Jacob were, of the sons of Jacob were about to come to Egypt to live with Joseph in Goshen. This is the place where God protected the Israelites from the famines, the plagues, the darkness, the boils, the hail, even the death of the firstborn. This is where they put the blood on the door before the angel of death passed over, where Passover comes from. This is where our communion meal actually uh, comes from in the first covenant of Moses. Before that, it was the bread and the wine to Melchizedek to Abraham to institute the first covenant. 
The second covenant was the blood and the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, which happens on the night of Passover, commemorating this event. So, watch what happens in the place of Goshen. He had sent, now the he here is Jacob, which is surnamed Israel. He had sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph to show the way before him to Goshen so that they could come into the land of Goshen. So when Israel and 75 people came from Canaan, the land of Canaan, to live with Joseph in the land of Egypt, remember Pharaoh gave him the best part of the land. After Joseph was reunited to his brothers, he said, is my father still alive? This is after the they came and got the grain and then they came back with the silver cup and they said, what is this? And then Joseph later sent uh, guards there and said, how did, can you steal from the master's house? And they said, we didn't. And then Joseph basically was testing them and then he reconciled to them after Benjamin was uh, going to be kept back because uh, Reuben said, I said to my father, Israel or Jacob, that if I came back without Benjamin, it would be on my life and my son's. And so he said, you can't do this. It would send my father to the grave because he already lost one son. And that son was Joseph. So God in his mercy reconciled all of them. But the Lord sent Judah first as a forerunner, if you will, to go before Jacob or Israel and all of his children and all of their children, all their flocks and herds and Joseph. So he becomes a forerunner to the place of freedom, to the place of provision, to the place of protection. This is why David is so, it's amazing what God allowed David to do because David was the first Israelite besides Abram. Now remember, Abraham offered Isaac and an angel stopped him before the knife entered his son to show that he trusted him with the blessings of God, with the miracle of God. I gave you a son, but do you love me more than the son? Prove it by giving him up. The moment he was going to prove it, God stopped him. He said, your heart is right. He became the patriarch or the first blessing. That happened on Mount Moriah. So, so even before the Jebusites were there, Abraham was there in covenant with God and made an altar, which is like putting the flag in the soil for the believers. It's more than that. It, it's a place of God's residence, God's real estate. Later on, the Jebusites came and squatted there, if you will. And then David, around 999 to 1000 BC, he goes into Jerusalem the city of rest and, and grants the city, conquers the city from the Jebusites so that we have a land now. And that's headquarters in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem is where Zion is, is where Mount Moriah was, where Isaac uh, and Abraham had the experience with God on the altar, the miraculous deliverance and testing and trusting and provision of the ram, which is Jesus Christ the Lord. That's right. The atonement sacrifice for all of us. So by Judah going first and David coming from the line of Judah, David goes before us into our freedom. Remember, he was, if it wasn't for David, we wouldn't have relief from the Philistines, from all of the surrounding people. Um, and not only that, he brought the tribes of Israel together. He unified them in the unified kingdom. Then later it was divided. And who brings us together again? Not just the divided kingdom, but all the nations. Someone else from the tribe of Judah, another foreigner. This one is Christ. He goes before us into heaven. He goes before us on earth. He goes before us in the power of the Holy Spirit. And he goes before us to make atonement. So remember, it's no light thing that these prophetic acts happened all the way back in Genesis 46, pointing to the archetype of our redemption and our freedom, who is the forerunner of all life, the prince of the living, the author of the living and the dead, the judge of the living and the dead, the author of life, the author and finisher of your faith, and that is Jesus Christ the Lord the Lion of the tribe of Judah. I want to read to you the blessing that his father Israel, or Yaakov, gave to him. It's coming from Genesis 49, and it reads, Judah, your brothers, shall praise you. On your hand shall be the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons, your father's sons will bow before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion, and as a lioness, who dares to rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples, binding his foal to the vine, and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine, and his vesture in the blood of grapes, 
His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth are whiter than milk. Now, first of all, Jesus comes from the tribe of Judah and rides the cult. Be comforted, O Israel. Be comforted, O Zion, for your king. He comes to you righteous and victorious, riding on a cult. Now, why is this prophetic? Because when David was king and he was about to go to the other side, to heaven, his son, Adonijah, tried to basically make himself king. He tried to have a self-coronation, tried to gather one of the priests with the holy oil, Abiathar, and blow the trumpets. But we know that Zadok and Natan, the prophet, were faithful to David. And David and Bathsheba uh, had a meeting. And Bathsheba said, hey, Adonijah is trying to coordinate himself by the altar. And David said, what? I swore to you by the Lord God of Israel that Solomon Sholoam, your son, will be king, which means peace. And she said, indeed. So he said, get on my donkey, have Nathan the prophet and Zadok, Zadok, Zaduki, Sadducees, that's where Sadducees come from. They were the temple keepers. He was a priest. He said, have Zadok and Nathan come and anoint Solomon with the holy oil and ride the colt and pronounce him king at the spring of Gihon, which is where David's, one of David's commanders, Joab, climbed unto to conquer the city from the Jebusites, the Jebusites in the first place. That was one of the major springs that still flows to this day, the spring of Gihon. Now, then Solomon's courted king, and so we know that only he who rides the donkey is the real deal. So now we understand on Palm Sunday when Jesus comes into the triumphal entry, why is he not riding a war horse? Because he's the legitimate. He is the legitimate prince of Israel, the king of all kings and the lord of all lords. Okay, and this is in the prophecy. Now, interesting that it says your brothers will bow to you. That was said of Joseph. Remember that dream got him thrown into the cistern by his brothers. They said, well, we come and bow to you. But we know that God reserved his blessing from Judah because after Saul from the tribe of Benjamin, after he dies on the battlefield with his son Benjamin, we know that David is crowned king and that in the line of David, that the scepter does not depart. There were even times where kings were wicked. They should have been destroyed and cut down. And God said, you know what? Until they bear a son, I'm going to let them remain because of the covenant that I swore to their father, David. David was the apple of God's eye. Speaking of praise, David's in the field with a harp, blessing God. Matter of fact, most of the 150 Psalms are written by David. And Psalms, right, was originally from the Psalter, which was a song book, a book of songs and poems that David himself wrote. Later on, some of his chief musicians wrote some of them, in which case it writes, for an example, a mascal of a king by Asaph or something like this in the Psalms. It's very clear. But most of them were written by David, and they were written in, in real time. This was like his prayer journal, his prayer diary, his prayer log. He'd wake up distressed and say, oh, my soul, I'm in distress. Why are you distressed on my soul? He'd cry out and praise to God. He'd remember God's goodness, and by the end of the psalm, He's back to his place of peace. Now, it does say, but you, O Bethlehem, are the are not the least of the rulers of Jerusalem, which means that the kings come from Bethlehem. Now, let me give you a mystery. David was from Bethlehem. That's where he tended sheep, okay? Now, David, right, means beloved. The name means beloved, David. David's tending sheep in Bethlehem. Remember when Samuel goes to anoint the sons of Jesse, by the way, the name branch, right, is a prophetic term. It, it speaks to the Messiah. It means Netzar. Remember, there's a scripture where it says Jesus went to uh, Nazareth, so it would be fulfilled what the prophet said that he shall come out of Nazareth or be a Nazarene. The word Netzar is branch. So Nazarin, you're from Nazareth, actually means in Hebrew, you're a branch. It's like a word play. So all of these scriptures are referring to Jesus. Okay, so that makes sense. David's there. Saul, uh, Samuel's about ready to anoint the oldest son of Jesse. Nope, not the next one, not the next one, not the next one, not the next one. And the Lord said, I don't judge the way you judge. Don't lay a hand on any of these men. So he says, so you guys have another son or what? He says, yeah, well, David, he's in the field. Remember, David, God's hand came upon him. He was anointed with oil. It was not king coronated for 17 years. But remember, in this anointing, he slayed Goliath. He went out and led Israel into military victory. He was not so much as touched by a sword. There's a song about David. It said, Saul killed thousands and David has slain tens of thousands. Ten thousands. Not even touched by a sword. He was invincible in the power of God because he obeyed God. 
He sought the heart of God. As a matter of fact, we started in a tabernacle, right? Which is a tent. And David is in a house of cedar, a cedar palace that was made with the cedars of Lebanon. And one day he says to God, wait a minute, how is it that I am in a house of cedar and you are in a tent? Now, God says to David, I never asked for that. Did I ever ask you for a house? He said, but it's very good that that came into your heart because you know why? David was loving God the way he loved himself. Now we're supposed to love our neighbors, we love ourselves, and we're supposed to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Most people love and take care of themselves. Someone else in their family, yeah, of course, their loved one, sure, someone else, not sure. In the heart of God, you gotta love. You got to love. Now, when God said this to David, that's good that they came upon your heart, he granted him permissions, not to David, because he was a man of war, but his son, Solomon. So David amassed all of these materials, talents of gold. He made a, a contract with Huramari, uh, Huramabi, who was the, uh, he was from the tribe of Naphtali, and he was in uh, modern day Akko, which is Tyre and Sidon, and where the Sidon, Sidonians were, David said, no one could cut lumber like you guys. He made a contract with him through Solomon, and David had a great relationship with him, which Solomon carried on to made a contract of cords of wheat, baths of oil, and wine and land. He gave him 20 cities in exchange for all the cedar wood of Lebanon to build the Beth the Mikdash, the house of God. Because the cedar of Lebanon, there's no wood like the cedars of Lebanon, okay? Massive, massive trees, excellent source of building. Matter of fact, they found some on the Temple Mount that dated to 999 BC. Why is that important? Because David was 1000 BC. And if we have wood from 1000 BC, we know why it's on the Temple Mount, because it's coming from the storehouse of David that he set aside to become the Beth the Mikdash, which was by Solomon. So back to Bethlehem. Why was Jesus born in Bethlehem? First of all, this is where David was born. So someone who's gonna be a Messiah, an archetype like David was, then he's gonna be born in Bethlehem, by the way. Beth means house, like Beth the Mikdash, Bethel, Beth Seda, and Lechem means bread. Bethlehem is the house of bread. Jesus said, I am the living bread. I am the true bread that came down from heaven, right? Must be. So back to Bethlehem. This is what the prophecy reads. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least of the rulers of Judah. And from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Now this shepherd is the great shepherd of all sheep, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He comes from Bethlehem, the house of bread. Now, why was he born in the manger slash stable? A manger is a feed trough and it's made out of stone uh, and it's a man of stone so it won't tip over. Nowadays they make them out of steel but a manger is a feed trough and a stable or a large manger is something that looks like a barn, right? We know the Christmas scene and the Christmas setting. So the question is, king of kings and ruler of all the universe, right? And God appears by an angel to Mary and to Joseph in a dream twice with an angel. Why is it that when they went in the inn, there was no room and they had to have Jesus in a stable? It's like, what's that all about, right? I mean, God provides, praise God. Do you know that all temple sacrifices were born in a stable? So why is he born in a stable, right, of all places? I mean, he's God in the flesh. Okay, do you know that in Bethlehem, where David was the shepherd of sheep, a lot of sheep in Bethlehem. Matter of fact, Bethlehem was known for A-plus sheep. The, the sheep of all sheep come from Bethlehem. It was... 5.2 miles away from Jerusalem, and this is where you went if you wanted to get like the Passover lambs. They came from Bethlehem. So if Jesus is the lamb that takes away the sin of the world, he should be born in Bethlehem. The land apportioned to Judah was massive. Judah had the largest portion of land next to Menashe. Their first census was like 76,000 people. So Simeon ended up living with Judah. Now remember, even when the kingdom split after Solomon, his son Rehoboam versus the tribe leader from Ephraim, Jeroboam, tribes of Israel, 12 split. 10 went to the north 
and the south was Judah and Benjamin. And of course, Levi, the tribe of the priests that stayed faithful to the temple, were obviously in Judah as well. And the people submitted to the yoke of Rehoboam, who should have listened to the wise counselors of his father Solomon, who said, lighten the yoke on the people. And he said, my little finger is thicker than my father's thigh. He disciplined you with whips. I'm going to use scorpions. So they decided to rebel and not to serve him. But actually, this was prophetic because of the sins of Solomon. Okay, back to David. Now, David was a warrior, right? He was a warrior poet. He was like a priest, prophet, and king in some way, shape, or form because he was right in his heart with God. He wrote the Psalms, which guide people. By the way, you want to know, how do I pray? How do I worship? Get into the Psalms and, and let that be like a training wheels, if you will, a track like a railroad track rather to get into what is in the heart of God, the mind of God, the emotions of God, how to uh, grapple or wrestle with these things in prayer. Beautiful, beautiful language. Now, David, okay, David was also the one who established the presence of God in Zion or Zion. Zion gets its name because David brought the Ark of the Covenant after it was captured by the Philistines. This was before he became king. Saul was king. Uh, the ark was captured, Samuel, uh, I'm sorry, Eli and his two sons died, Hophni and Phinehas, because they were uh, sinning, fornicating with women that came to the tabernacle, and they both died on the battlefield. They took the ark out without permission. The ark is captured by the Philistines, and it goes several months to different cities in uh, Philistia, wreaking havoc. They finally send it back on an ark's cart. So the ark's at Aminadab's house. David goes to take it back to Jerusalem now that he's king. And after Aminadab, it comes from Aminadab's house. It's on an ox cart. It falters. Uzziah touches the ark. He dies. So they take it now to Obed-Edom's house, and it stays there. David goes and studies the Torah for three months and learns how to handle it. Finally, they go back and take it on poles all the way up to Zion. David builds a tent for it. It has 24-7 worship. We know this as Zion properly, the presence of God. Then later in 1 Kings chapter 8, it says Solomon took the ark of God out of Zion and all of the furniture from the tabernacle and brought it up to Mount Moriah. Now the reason you need to know that is there was all these videos that said that the temple of God was never on Mount Moriah. It was in uh, Mount Zion. Okay, now the, the tent was at Mount Zion and they did offer sacrifices there. So of course we find evidence for that. But obviously the Bible is the key fact and the word was God. So we don't refute that. Okay, we have to understand it and then base our archaeology on that, which all corroborates the temple was on Mount Moriah. Okay, now Moriah means the place where Yahweh will teach us. Mori, teacher, Yah, Yahweh. So David was the one who instituted the presence of God right in at the Temple Mount because he brought it really next to its neighbor, if you will, Mount Zion. Then Solomon brought it up to Mount Moriah, fulfilling its destiny, which where we know it rested up until 70 AD. David said, this one thing I desire in Psalm 27, 4, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and to gaze upon his beauty as I seek him in his temple. I mean, talk about the how to, to be with you, God, in your place, in your room, to be in the house of God all the days of my life. And to seek you in the beauty of your place, and to seek your beauty in the place of your holiness, in the place of your habitation, to dwell with God, actually, the Lord our God. Now, Jesus, son of David, or Lord of David, Jesus said, they said, Son of David, have mercy on us. And Jesus said, how can he, right earlier, then he heals the blind men. Then later on, he questions the Pharisees. And he says, how can the Messiah be the son of David if David calls him Lord? Now, in Psalm 110, remember I said David wrote the Psalms. Psalm 110 says, that, Lord said unto my Lord, sit at your right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So David, or Jesus said, how can David be his Father, in other words, how can he be the son of David? David calls him Lord. Now let's pick up this a little bit further. In the same psalm, it says, The Lord is sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Later on in Hebrews, it says Melchizedek. That's no, no priesthood comes from Judah. 
And who's Melchizedek? Melchizedek means king of righteousness, king of peace. Melchizedek, right? Melech is king, Sadek is righteousness, a righteous one. He was the king of Yerushalayim, by the way, okay? If Melchizedek blessed Abraham with bread and wine, that's where our communion comes from, by the way, right? He blessed him, he instituted the Passover with bread and wine, the body of the Lord, to verify the true priesthood. You see, it can't be attained by the blood of goats and bulls because we're humans. Genesis says the blood of man for the blood of man. So how can we be atoned by the blood of an animal? We men have to be atoned by the blood of a man. This is why Jesus Christ was crucified and bled for us. Now, his body and his bread proves that we are grafted in all the way back to Abraham, or Abraham who received the priesthood, right? The, the covenant of God. You'll be a nation of believers. That's what he said to Moses. But that was a covenant of Abraham realized on Mount Sinai by bread and wine, by bread and blood, by the body and the blood. That was by Melchizedek. One that said, has no mother, no father, no beginning of days, no end of life, but has the power of an ever-ending life. This is what it said of Jesus Christ, who, provides, who abides perpetually as a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So we know that this psalm is talking about Jesus Christ, right? The Lord of David. And one more. In Acts chapter 2, get this. I saw, this is what it says, David says concerning him, meaning concerning Jesus Christ. I saw the Lord always before me, and he is at my right hand that I might not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced and my flesh will also dwell in hope. You will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor let your Holy One see corruption. You have made me known the path of life and will make me full in gladness with your presence. That's what David said about Jesus, right? Remember, Jesus was resurrected. His Holy One didn't see decay. It says, brothers, I say to you confidently that the patriarch David both died and was buried in his tomb to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn to him an oath that he would set one of his descendants on the throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he would not abandon to Hades his soul nor his flesh would see corruption. This Jesus God raised up and we are all witnesses. Therefore he is exalted at the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit he's poured out upon us this day of what you both see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but of himself he says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, tell and make your enemies your footstool. And of this Jesus Christ, of, of the house of Israel, therefore know and be certain that God has made both Lord and Christ this Jesus who you crucified. So we know David had fellowship with Jesus. He, he, I saw the Lord always at my right hand that I wouldn't be moved, and he's a prophet. I mean, it's like, you're kidding me? So not only is he not the son of David, it's more like we know who David was worshiping now, right? We know why he's the apple of God's eye, because he who receives the son has the father also. And he who comes from God has to accept Jesus Christ, because if you don't accept Jesus Christ, how can you accept the father for which has come in the flesh? Emmanuel, God with us. Okay, this is just a little bit about Yehuda, the people of praise, who you and I have now become because Jesus Christ gave us power to become the sons of God. Remember that God uses all things for the good. Remember that God is good. Bless him. Do you know the job of the priests is to bless and call upon the name of the Lord? This is what David always did. And it says, who commits your way to the Lord, it shall succeed. David committed everything to the Lord. He was Always praying. Pray without ceasing. So it says in the New Testament. Now, let's finish on this note with Yehuda, people of praise. Today, the nation of Israel has the Tekelet colors and the Mog and David on the flag. And we know that the heart of David, the lion heart, that's what they call it. Have you ever heard of the term lion heart? It means to have a heart of passion, a heart of power, a heart of... Uh, I like sacrifice, but dedication, devotion. This comes from David, the lion heart. And we know that our God is the lion of Judah. That's Jesus Christ who comes from the tribe of Judah. Now, when Jesus was born, we know that Aries, the star that the, Mag, that the Magi saw, the star of Bethlehem rose in conjunction with Aries, the ram or the lamb. Remember, a ram is a full-grown lamb 
and Jesus grew to, he was full grown, he ministered, right? 30 years old, age of maturity. So we know that star came up. Well, when he comes back, it will be Leo the lion in the constellations. This is what is spoken of Messiah, Jesus, about the Maseroth. And so we know that the lion of Judah, when he returns, we're going to see Judah, the signs and wonders. We're going to see Judah high above Jerusalem. Now we also know that Jerusalem, the city of peace, Jeru city, Sal Shalim or Shalom, same name as Solomon, same root word, is the city of peace. We know it's only a city of peace because the Prince of Peace. It's a holy city because God is holy and God dwelt there in the flesh. Emmanuel. He was born of men, seen of angel angels, vindicated in the spirit, worshipped, died, gave up the ghost, rose again, received on high, at the right hand, bestowed the rock, Kodesh, the power of the Holy Spirit of God to all believers who trust in him, who will see him face to face. Every eye will see him, every every ear will hear that Jesus Christ is Lord and bow, hallelujah, because he's the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords. Only he who can unite the peoples, both the Jews and the Gentiles, all nations will be united in Messiah Yeshua and Jesus Christ the Lord, both now and upon his return. The question is, the question is, on his return you'll bow whether you like it or not. The question is, will you bow willingly now because of his majesty, because of his greatness, because of his love, because of his honor, because of his power, because he died for you. His majesty is unending. His dominion will be from sea to sea. Beloved, there's no area that Jesus has not conquered. If you give your life to him, you will be aware of his majesty and his power because there's nothing he can't do. There's nothing he won't do. Also, why did he come in the flesh? Because he's not a hypocrite, beloved. He's not going to do something or ask you to do something that he's not already done or isn't willing to do with you. He rolled up his sleeves. He came down, surrendered the deity, walked in the life of a man and the body of a man with the Holy Spirit of God so that we could do everything he did. Beloved, this is the key and secret to the life of God. Let Jesus be your example for everything. Yahshua, the Lord, saves, keeps safe, makes whole, right? This is the Lord our God who lives forever. And this is the Lion from the tribe of Judah.